Yeah, see the see the participants getting on. I'll give it a few minutes here and get, get started. Another minute here. <clears throat> All right. You guys want to go ahead and get started here? Sounds good. All right. Sure. Thanks. Thanks everybody for joining, joining tonight. Um, so this is uh, the way we're running. This is Dr. Dr. McFarland, Dr. Srage and myself are going to be the only ones able to, uh, to talk here. So um, you will see there's a, there's a Q and a button on your screen. So if you do have a question, you'll be able to click on that and then type in, um, type in any questions you have at the end of the session. We'll go over a little bit of a Q and A. Um, this is being recorded, so we'll, we will send out a recording of this um, after after the session. A little brief overview. So I'm I'm Andrew. I've spoken to a handful of you, but I'm actually the local representative for Pain Tech. Um, so I'll be the one working directly with Dr. Sreja, Dr. McFarland, um, and and yourself um, in order to answer any questions you have about this procedure. Um, again, Pain Tech is a uh, company that's been around since. 2015. Um, it's a minimally invasive option for patients who are experiencing chronic sacroiliac uh, joint pain. Um, obviously, you all are a patient of either Dr. Srage and Dr. McFarland. Um, and without without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Srage and we can get we can get the webinar kicked off. Evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm. Dr. Sereja, and uh, I'm the Interventional Pain Management Specialist at Orthopedic and Spine Center, and I'm joined by Dr. Mark McFarland, who's uh, one of our orthopedic spine surgeons, and we're excited to bring you uh, information about this new procedure that um, is hopefully going to revolutionize pain care for our patients that have been suffering for a long time with sacroiliac joint pain. Um, if you're suffering with back pain, uh, it's very possible that your pain is related to the sacroiliac joint, which is a major joint that attaches your spine to the pelvis. Um, about 15 to 30 percent of all back pain has been found to be related to the sacroiliac joint, and unfortunately, it's oftentimes misdiagnosed. A lot of our patients have pain in the lower back or buttocks that, um, you know, they've had many tests, MRIs, scans, and, and doctor visits, and um, no one can really figure out what's going on. They've been through physical therapy and medications, and, um, you know, they continue to have pain with just normal day-to-day -day activities, like getting up out of a chair or turning over in bed, and folks that lo love to run um, and uh, do other activities that are more athletic, like uh, horseback riding, they're just unable to do these things anymore. And, uh, you know, oftentimes, uh, one of the most common things patients tell me is that, you know, I have this pain. Um, down near my hip and butt, and it feels like someone's stabbing, stabbing me with a hot poker or an ice pick. And, um, you know, that, that sort of sets off alarms in my head that, you know, we might be dealing with sacroiliac joint pain, especially when all of the imaging studies, whether it's your x-rays of your spine or your MRI, just doesn't really give us any information. Um, and so, you know, these folks end up getting uh, injections in other areas of their back to rule out, you know, a disc issue or a pinched nerve, and nothing really seems to work. Um, and so, 
you know, one, one important thing about coming in and seeing us is that, you know, you're put through multiple physical exam tests in order to determine if this is what's causing your pain. Next slide, please. So very commonly, our patients who come to see us have, have seen other specialists, whether it's a physical therapist, their primary care doctor, um, they've seen neurosurgeons um, and have been offered surgery, yet uh, they're unsure and they continue to have pain and have maybe even gone through a, a back surgery or had a spinal cord stimulator implanted, um, or they've had multiple sacroiliac joint injections that initially worked, maybe lasted for three to six months. But then over time, this, the, the space between the injections has grown smaller and they're not getting the same level of relief they once used to. And a lot of things can explain that, but very commonly over time, the joint can become either more loose or, or more tight. Um, arthritis can develop, and oftentimes patients will go to PT or chiropractic care and be told that, you know, your pelvis is out of line, and if we crack it this way or realign it, your pain will be a lot better, and temporarily it is. And unfortunately, you know, once they start becoming active again, that pain does return. Um, oftentimes patients try a host of medications starting with anti-inflammatories and Tylenol, and then we progress to um, nerve pain medications, uh, muscle relaxers, and unfortunately a lot of patients have to uh, resort to opioids and um, narcotic medications in order to find any relief. And uh, as you can tell, um, in most states now, getting opiates and being managed with narcotics is becoming more and more difficult. Um, oftentimes we, besides just cortisone shots into the joint, we've tried uh, platelet-rich plasma, which is using the patient's own blood to inject back into the joint to hopefully create an inflammatory environment, which leads to uh, tissue tightening and, and further uh, uh, anti-inflammatory, uh, inflammatory reduction and strengthening of the ligaments that support the joint. Um, when those things fail, uh, we can try to get insurance to cover an ablation or nerve uh, cauterization of the nerves that supply the sacroiliac joint. Uh, but what we find is that most insurances do not cover this procedure um, in, in the st uh, state of Virginia, um, even Medicare, which typically covers most procedures, including this one that we're talking about tonight, um, won't cover the ablation. So here's a diagram of what the sacroiliac joint actually looks like. Um, that big triangular uh, bone that you see in the middle is called the sacrum, and that is directly attached to the lowest vertebrae in, in, in your lower back. And the joints that are uh, most important in what we're discussing tonight are the joint between the sacrum and the pelvis. And the, the pelvic bone that attaches to the sacrum is called the ilium, and so the two of them together form the sacroiliac joint. Now, if you think about the forces that go through this joint, it's, it's pretty incredible because this is the only two points of contact that our body has between the upper body and our lower body. So all of our body weight from the lowest uh, point of your spine all the way up to the top of your head are traveling through these two joints on a daily basis. And so um, over time, if those joints take on excessive stress, they can become either too loose or develop arthritis and, and then any, any movement, even if it tightens up the joint, is going to be extremely painful. Um, and, and again, what, we, uh, what I mentioned at the beginning is that up to 30% of all low back pain is related to the sacroiliac joint and can be misdiagnosed as something completely un unrelated. And, um, you know, oftentimes it, the interventions that we try at the beginning work great and unfortunately over time they become either less effective or they last for shorter periods of time, or they stop working entirely. So what causes sacroiliac joint pain? Well, as I mentioned before, the most common is, is when the joint becomes too loose and unstable, and that can happen from a, a host of different things, whether it's uh, a fall, and most commonly we hear about falls where the patient lands very, very hard on their buttocks, and that can disrupt the ligaments that stabilize the joint. Um, it can be a work injury, a car accident. Um, it can be um, overactivity or repetitive activities. Um, pregnancy is a, a very common one that loosens the joint because during pregnancy, the uh, 
uh, there a lot of hormones are released that are intended to loosen the pelvis to allow increased space for the baby to develop. Um, but oftentimes, the, after the hormones are gone, those ligaments just don't tighten back up. Um, other times, folks who have back surgery, you know, the forces change in, in what, where uh, uh, movement is occurring. And if uh, the lower portion of the spine is fused, um, inevitably, um, those forces have to be transmitted elsewhere. Not always, but sometimes they can be transmitted to the sacroiliac joint, um, which can lead to an increase in, in pain and development of arthritis over time. And just like any other joint in the body, there's lots of nerve endings in the sacroiliac joint. They're not the same nerves that travel down your legs, but they can mimic those type of nerve pains. And so oftentimes, not only is the pain in the lower back and buttocks area, but it can also cause numbness and tingling and burning um, and weakness in the, in the legs, either one leg or both. Um, but it's usually um, isolated to the side that's affected. Uh, unfortunately for some people, the pain can be on both sides. Um, uh, and, and that can still be treated the same way we're going to discuss tonight. Um, what we find with patients that have had um, uh, interventions to treat the SI joint pain, uh, at the end of the treatment, when all other options are becoming less effective or failing, uh, we've often, often discussed sending them for a referral for what's called an open surgical uh, sacroiliac joint fusion. And Dr. McFarland will uh, discuss why that option has become less uh, favorable uh, long term. It's a whole host of reasons, and that's one of the reasons why Paintech created this device, because a posterior approach not only is much safer, but is found to be more effective um, in their new study. So before Dr. McFarland gets into um, how the procedure is done and what it entails, I did want to mention that, that Paintech just released their, their 12 month study looking at um, uh, 83 patients that, uh, there was a, over 100 patients that started in the study and 83 that completed the study after 12 months. And what they found was um, not only was there a significant improvement in the patient's pain scores from before the implant to after at 12 months, that pain relief was sustained over the, over the entire 12 months. Um, the, the, there were very few adverse events in the entire trial. There was five adverse events, um, and only um, one of them was directly related to the procedure, which was an anesthetic-related issue. Um, the implant also improved other things besides just pain, right? So, you know, am I going to be able to get back to doing things that I, want, that I enjoy doing? What they found was, um, uh, there was also significant improvement in uh, outside perceived uh, disability that the patient was having, including difficulty sleeping. You know, a lot of times patients have this pain where um, just turning over in bed is extremely painful and they feel that sharp stabbing pain. And so there was a significant improvement in pain, um, I'm sorry, in, in sleep disturbances, um, fatigue during the daytime because they're sleeping better. Um, there's less anxiety, less depression. Um, and they were able to return to their uh, social roles, like if they're the, the leader of the household, the main um, money maker, they're able to return to those type of jobs and also the activities that they enjoyed doing prior to this pain developing. Um, and so we saw a significant improvement in physical functioning during, um, during this uh, study. Um, and all these were statistically significant measures that um, you know, they would, they, the study would not have been able to show that this was a safe and effective treatment option unless they met those um, outcomes. So then I'll let Dr. McFarland discuss the procedure itself. And then at the end, I'll, I'll join again and, and uh, hopefully answer any questions you have. Thanks. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Mark McFarland. I'm one of the orthopedic spine surgeons here at the Orthopedic and Spine Center. And Dr. Suresh and I work hand in hand to treat a lot of patients with spinal pain, pelvic pain, hip pain. And, and you're seeing that a lot of these issues, a lot of these diagnoses that you may have many of can give you symptoms in the same location. So at times it's very difficult and you're, you'll see that we're, we're testing and we're doing procedures to try to rule out what is causing your pain or rule in what, what is the 
primary pain generator for you. And we're finding that the sacroiliac joints over time are, are a significantly undertreated component of that pain. And I see it a lot in my practice because whenever we perform procedures on patients on their lumbar spine and we fuse those segments, like Dr. Sereja stated, we are taking the stress from the lower lumbar spine and we're placing it onto those joints that are adjacent. And if we're fusing people down to the sacrum, we're putting a lot of stress on the sacroiliac joint. So that's one common area in my practice where I see a lot of sacroiliac joint dysfunction, but obviously it can be related to trauma. It can be related to childbirth and pregnancy. It can be related to just simple degeneration over time. Um, it's our job, obviously, when we see you in the office to confirm that the SI joints are part of your, uh, your, your pain paradigm and what's, what's leading to some chronic pain issues for you. Historically, spine surgeons have not tackled the sacroiliac joint simply because the outcomes with treating this joint have not been good. Uh, we either had to employ significant open procedures. We're talking about three to four inch incisions where we're going down and trying to graft the joint, um, having to use screws or other metallic devices to try to compress the joint together and force it to fuse. Uh, that was complicated by either bleeding, hematomas, infections, uh, the spine, the, the SI joints not fusing, or even in some cases, nerve and muscle pain because the, the access to get to this joint was historically from a lateral approach now uh, that goes through your hip, let's say over your bursa area. Uh, most surgeons in the United States are not performing that procedure. So we'll send patients to our physical med rehab partners to look at these injections or ablations, hopeful to help for some period of time uh, but as we're seeing, these injections over time usually will last less and less, and you end up with chronic pain that's difficult to treat. If you, if you think about a procedure where you're talking about a three or four inch incision to try to fuse the joint with metallic implants, I want you to look at the picture in the right corner where you see an implant the size of an almond. So you see that implant and you can imagine how minimally invasive that we can be to place this implant. And we're talking about using an approach that is the same approach that we use when we put injections into the sacroiliac joint. So by doing that, it becomes very, very minimally invasive. And we're seeing that the results, you know, some of the results are 85, 90% success rate with doing this procedure. So, uh, and it's an outstanding success rate for, for patients that hopeful, hopefully we'll be able to pass on to a lot of our patients here in Newport News and the surrounding area. So if we get into the procedure, again, it's a small incision. Usually we're talking about an incision that's one inch or possibly less. Um, it's an outpatient procedure. You'll come in, you'll have the surgery. The surgery will potentially take 30 minutes to do this procedure. Um, and whenever we close the skin, there'll be about a one inch incision like we stated, the incision's covered with glue. There's no stitches or staples or anything that you have to take out later. You're able to use a waterproof dressing. You're able to shower the next day uh, after the procedure. Since the procedure is very minimally invasive, there is very low risk for any infections. Um, uh, usually we'll, be, we'll bring you in and we'll give you an antibiotic prior to the procedure. And then you'll be discharged home with an oral antibiotic that you'll take for five to seven days after the procedure. Um, it's a fairly speedy recovery. You're a little sore after the initial procedure that go up, goes away pretty quick in the first two days. Uh, you're left with a little soreness and some restrictions that we'll have to put you on for a few weeks. And we'll discuss those restrictions in a few minutes. I see the next slide, please. So this is a side view of the sacroiliac joint. Uh, so this implant, the link Q, we're looking at the allograft or the device that we place into the joint. It's actually made of bone. So again, there's no metal, there's no screws that are utilized with this device at all. If you think about the sacroiliac joint, you're basically looking at a space that's between two bone surfaces. We're 
basically placing this implant, which is a, a piece of bone between those two bone surfaces to distract the surfaces and to get bone to grow between those surfaces to fuse that joint. Um, the implant has an empty space in the middle and we'll put a specialized type of uh, biological or bone graft inside that space when we implant it into the sacroiliac joint. And your, your body uh, will, will basically send its own repair mechanisms and cells to the area to help it to fuse. And it basically looks at it almost like it's a fracture. If you break your arm or you break your leg, a little period of time and your body will make that bone grow back together. Well, in this situation, that's really the same thing. We're, we're turning that joint into uh, an area where your body senses it as a, a broken bone or a fracture and we'll go through a healing mechanism to make the bone grow together. And that'll take somewhere between three months to six months for the, to completely form into solid bone. Next picture. Uh, so let's go ahead and play the video if we can, so that they can see the implant being placed. I'll talk a little as we're seeing that. Paintex Link is an innovative way to solve patients' SI joint pain using SI stabilization with a minimally invasive medical procedure. Patients get long-term benefits and faster recovery than other SI fusion methods. The process is broken down into four steps. First, the Steinman pin is inserted into the SI joint between the sacrum and the ilium. There is no drilling involved. Next, the tissue dilator and working cannula are inserted, creating separation in the joint. Then, the brooch rasp is inserted to create room for the link allograft to fit comfortably and at the same time initiate decortication. The brooch and rasp are removed with a simple unscrew, reverse hammer, and pull motion. Finally, a large graft window of the link allograft is filled with DBM and placed into the SI joint. The inserter ensures that the link is positioned perfectly, allowing SI fusion to begin. This step helps create the perfect growth environment for Link to work. Link enables you to fix the pain, not mask it, allowing your patients the ability to take back their life again. So in that video, you saw the implant being placed. You saw how small that implant was. Uh, the, the graft they call DBM, uh, that's basically a cadaveric bone graft that we use. I use commonly in my spinal fusions and either the cervical and the lumbar spine has an incredibly high fusion rate. Um, and typically there's no uh, issues related to infection or rejection uh, in the human body with, with that type of implant. We place additional bone graft, that DBM through the funnel into the back of this implant to really help increase that surface area that the SI joint will fuse. Uh, next video, please. Okay, so basically after the procedure, so what you're gonna experience well, on a day if you come in, let's say Dr. Suraj or I have confirmed that your sacroiliac joint is a, a significant component of your pain. You're going to come into our office. Um, we'll have one of our, our our techs start an IV, and you'll be given an antibiotic prior to the procedure. You'll be placed on a table that allows us to get x-rays through that, um, utilizing that x-ray machine called a C-arm. We'll uh, use a, a, a baby needle, basically a 25-gauge needle, to numb the skin over your sacroiliac joint and the soft tissue. So you may feel a little pinprick when we do that but it's, it's fairly, fairly benign to have that numbing medicine placed. After we have numbed the tissue, we place that little guide pin down into the sacroiliac joint and we're able to make a small incision over that guide pin to then gain access into the joint. Once we spread the joint, you'll feel a little pressure as we open the joint. And then we use what's called a rasp. And with the rasp, basically we're removing the soft tissues in the joint between the bone, trying to get the bone ready for fusion. 
So you'll, you'll, you'll feel that distraction. It'll feel like pressure when we're doing that. And then we're placing the bone graft. So this whole, this entire procedure, that portion of the procedure may take 15 minutes to perform the procedure for you. Um, the rest of the procedure is basically where we will close the skin and you utilize a special type of uh, surgical glue over the incision for you that then you can um, shower after the procedure. Initial activity, uh, we don't want you performing any heavy lifting, pushing, or pulling for the next two to six weeks after the procedure. You're able to walk. We encourage walking. Uh, we like you to have frequent position changes during the day. We don't really want you sitting for more than an hour or standing and walking for more than 20 minutes. You'll, you'll modify your activity frequently just to take pressure off of the joint. Um, you are allowed to shower. Uh, the only restrictions that I really have from a medication standpoint, we, we wouldn't have you utilizing any medicines that could risk the bone fusing. And we're talking about medicines that have some type of anti-inflammatory action. So ibuprofen, Aleve, Motrin, any type of oral steroids that you take daily, we'll have you, have you off of those medicines for a period of time while we watch the joint heal. And we'll bring you back at certain intervals to take x-rays to make sure that the joint is healing well. Um, I'll likely take an x-ray at three months and I'll likely take another x-ray at six months to kind of confirm that the joint is, is solidly united for you. And as we move through the weeks, we'll increase that activity level. So after six weeks, we'll let you do most of your normal activities in my practice. Um, if you are someone that's primarily sedentary, you can go back to your job at two weeks. If you're someone that has a very strenuous uh, occupation, um, then we may restrict that activity for six weeks. So it, it really depends on what your job is, how soon you'll go back, back to it. Uh, but you will be able to return to all acti activities eventually without any restrictions after this procedure. Um, let's see the next slide, please. So do we want to watch some of the uh, success videos there, Andrew? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Yep. Maddie, were those good to play? So here's a few videos of actual patients. For the for procedure. Procedure. I couldn't walk very far. I was in so much pain that I was willing to try anything. I've had injections and I've also had bricks inserted into the SI joints and they were not working. When it came to the point of being confined to home and losing independence, my reservations went on vacation. If you're going to prescribe medicine, I'm not going to take it. He says, that's good. I don't prescribe it. So we're going to get along just fine. To me, it was like pain free. And trust me, I've had more than my share of procedures. He got me all prepped, took me back there. And then they said, you can, you can get up now. <laughs> I'm a, you're done. I mean, that's how quick and easy it was. I saw the results right away. I just noticed that the pain is gone. It's great that I'm where I'm at. I'm, I'm back up and mobile and I'm very thankful for every day that I live. My uh, SI joint pain in the beginning when I first came to Dr. Azim was extremely severe and it was the point where I was basically immobile. It was an effort just to get out of the chair, to walk to the bedroom, to go to the restroom. You know, my hobby and passion is, is fishing and uh, to lose that was, was very frightening. You know, at first, of course, you have some reservations, but the way Dr. Azim explained it to me and how the procedure would work and how simple it was, it was really a no-brainer. It is a relatively non-invasive surgery. It's just a small incision, and then when you come out, everybody's so pleasant and nice. Well, if I had known sooner about the procedure, we'd have done it two years earlier. We went, went as, just as soon as we could get approval, and he'd done the diagnostic uh, injections prior to it. It's an amazingly simple, solution. There's no after feeling or that there's anything there. I just feel normal. And my pain was reduced by 85 or 90 percent 
fortunately, uh, after having the surgery, I've been able to go out in the boat, and we've been out several times. So you want to go over some of these, Raj? Yeah, so uh, these are the most common questions that, that patients ask when they have uh, this procedure. And, and uh, uh, you know, the difference between doing an in-office and uh, outpatient procedure versus the open, uh, open fusion um, is that the patient gets to go home the same day. And so there's no hospital stay. Um, there's no real observation for several hours afterwards. Typically, you come in, as Dr. McFarland said, you, you're greeted, you get your IV and your antibiotics and have the procedure done. You may be observed for, you know, maybe uh, half an hour afterwards to make sure that you don't have any sort of allergic reaction to any of the medications or that you don't have any numbness in your leg from the uh, anesthetic. But beyond that, um, you leave with your, your driver the same day. And uh, uh, not only is the procedure covered by Medicare, uh, to be done in a surgery center outpatient, but it's now covered to be done uh, in the office as well, which makes it very convenient for our patients that may have multiple medical issues that prevent them from undergoing anesthesia. Um, as you get older, you, uh, your doctor may not clear you for undergoing general anesthesia or even light sedation. And so ha being able to have this procedure done under local anesthetic is a huge benefit. Um, and as Dr. McFarland said, just because you've had a laminectomy uh, or, a, or a spinal fusion doesn't mean that you can't have this done. This is not related to the lumbar spine. Um, even if you've had a spinal cord stimulator and you have chronic sacroiliac joint pain, you're still a candidate for this if you're dealing with that and you're not getting adequate pain relief from um, the more conservative treatments that we're doing. Um, again, you can still have MRIs and CT scans because this is not a metallic uh, metallic object um, like a titanium screw which still doesn't uh, stop you from having an MRI but a spinal cord stimulator or bladder stimulator or other device like that or pacemaker that would prevent you from having an MRI or CT scan um, this is not like those type of devices um, and as you saw in the video the you know every case is different and everybody's anatomy is different but oftentimes once the procedure is over and you get off the table a lot of patients experience immediate pain relief. Um, obviously, there's going to be some procedural soreness once the anesthesia wears off. But as Dr. McFarland said, you're going to be up and walking um, as far as uh, not doing the excessive bending and twisting almost right away. And oftentimes, we see patients that have pain on, on both sides of their sacroiliac joint. Um, typically, we'll treat one side and see how you do with that um, so that you know, you're not uh, in, in a lot of pain after the procedure and, and are not able to get up and move around. So one side is done, um, and then we plan on, on having the other side done if, if there is pain on both sides. Go to um, our patient questions now. Oh, sorry, I'm muted. Yep, so we got, got a handful of questions here. Um, First question says, I have screws and back prior back fusion. Would I be a good candidate for this procedure? Uh, yeah, I could, I could jump on that. And that you're a common patient that we're going to see that's a great candidate for this procedure. I mean, having the instrumentation in your spine, having a true fusion, you are stressing those sacroiliac joints all the time. And, you know, obviously we're going to want to do some diagnostic, you know, things to prove that your SI joints are involved in your pain and there's not something else related to your spinal fusion or your previous surgery that's part of that. But most patients that have significant spinal fusions will have sacroiliitis and have sacroiliac pain that we can treat with this procedure. So, um, yeah, I'm, this is going to become a, a big part of my practice in general, looking at patients that have had previous spinal fusions and really evaluating those sacroiliac joints to see if this procedure can help your chronic pain issues. Yeah, well said. Uh, next question, um, we've answered some of these, but is it typical to perform this procedure bilaterally? Yeah, so as, as I just mentioned um, on the previous slide, 
if you have bilateral joint pain, typically we'll treat the more painful side first um, with the with the SI joint fusion, and plan on on getting the other side uh, fused at a later date, just so that there's not bilateral postoperative pain and you're able to get up and do more right after the uh, the procedure. All right. Next question. Um, how common is sacroiliac uh, with complex region syndrome? Complex regional pain syndrome, I'm assuming. Yeah. Uh, so the two are usually unrelated. Um, if when we do see sacroiliac joint pain in relation to complex regional pain syndrome, it's usually when that complex regional pain is in the, the legs or in the knee or the ankle or foot. And that actually uh, affects the gait so much that the patient alters how they're walking, how they're weight bearing on one leg or the other. And typically we'll see pain on the opposite side because now the patient shifts their body weight and their center of gravity over the side that normally doesn't hurt in order to take pressure off the side that is hurting from the complex regional pain. So then they end up developing uh, this inflammation and pain, sometimes instability within the sacroiliac joint. So yeah, I guess we do see any lower extremity injury or pain can lead to sacroiliac joint pain, such as hip arthritis, knee arthritis, complex regional pain, or anything where the patient ends up shifting their gait and they end up with a gait abnormality that leads to pain on the opposite side. Yeah. The questions are rolling in. You open the floodgates. Uh -huh. <laughs> it says, uh, is this done in the same place as we get um, the injections? Typically, yes. I mean, the, the, there, there will be options for where you can have it done, but for most patients, we'll be able to do it in the same location that you have your injections in our pain management center upstairs, done under local anesthesia, so you won't have to worry about any complications related to the general anesthetic or uh, significant sedation like you would have in another setting. Um, yeah. This next question says, how long, how long um, have you guys been doing this procedure? How many have, have each done? Well, procedures, sacral so, infusions have been being done for 50 years. Mm -hmm. This is a very new procedure, you know, for us. So we, I would say for me, in my standpoint, we've been doing this approach, the injections and placement into the sacroiliac joint for years, really for 18, 19 years in my case, um, that we've been doing these, uh, this exact approach for the procedure. The number of SI joint fusions that we've done with this technique, it's a brand new procedure. So those patients that sign up, we're going to make sure that they're great candidates for it um, and, and, and do them here at OSC and offer it to our patients in Newport News and the surrounding area. Yeah, and, and another um, bit of information is that the first in-office sacroiliac joint fusion using this procedure was done just this January. Brand so um, in, in, brand new as far as getting that uh, approval from Medicare and other insurers in order to have that site of service be in the office, which again, is a, is a great option for f uh, folks that can't or don't want to undergo general anesthesia or um, sedation for the procedure. Uh, the um, procedure that, in, uh, as Dr. McFarland said, the approach is exactly the same as the SI joint injections we've been doing for 20 years. Um, and the equipment that we're using is, is very similar to what we use to repair spinal fractures uh, in a procedure called kyphoplasty, so um, very adept at, at approaching bone and, and uh, you know, making uh, altera small alterations in the bone in order to uh, repair and, and improve pain. So um, it, it, it really is a minimally invasive procedure in that regard. Great. Next one. Um, so again, we kind of went over this, but do you do both sides? Um, I don't know if you want to speak to that again, but I mean, can kind of move on. I think you guys answered that one. Uh, let's see. Can this done? Yeah, same thing. Can this um, be done on both sides? We got a lot of bilateral SI joint pain. Also, if I have a, uh, both hips replaced. And the same thing. Commonly patients, commonly patients that have bilateral hip replacements, 
will develop sacroiliitis and lumbar degenerative disc disease. And patients that have had multi-level spinal fusions will develop sacroiliitis and over time may develop arthritis in their hips. So, you know, function, you know, a lot of times when we're doing things to, to relieve pain, let's say a spinal fusion in that circumstance, we all know that there are consequences of those procedures as well. We're placing stress in other areas of the body. Uh, and if you're someone that has a tendency for the connective tissue to degenerate, for you to develop laxity in the joints, or, or the, then the SI joint's a prime candidate for that as well. So just like your hips when they become arthritic or your spine when it becomes degenerated. So you're going to see a lot of patients that have had all of these procedures. You'll see patients that have ended up having to have a spinal fusion for lumbar degenerative disc disease, have had a hip replacement because the connective tissue in the hip has degenerated and thusly the joint between those two structures, the sacroiliac joint becomes unstable, starts to develop pain and ends up having to have a, a sacroiliac joint fusion. So a lot of these procedures are going to ultimately go together um, and be a part of a continuum of just general back and pelvic pain that we see routinely. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, this this other question, we've spoken to it, but I'll, I'll just read it. Um, <clears throat> Both, both hips replaced, I've had both hips replaced twice, had lumbar fusion, epidural shots and lower back with very little relief. Do these combination of past surgeries sound like I may be a good candidate, ten terrible pain every day, difficulty walking and standing? Yeah, so uh, typically when you'll see myself or Dr. McFarlane, you're going to be put through a pretty extensive physical examination and history. And part of that history is to determine if the symptoms that you're experiencing are common to sacroiliac joint pain but then doing the physical examination that isolates SI joint dysfunction versus pain emanating from another structure, either in the spine or pelvis. Um, once we've determined that the pain could be coming from the sacroiliac joint, the next step would be a diagnostic injection where anesthetic is injected into the sacroiliac joint. And we monitor for several hours how much of your pain is resolved, if you can walk and stand better, if you can bend over with less difficulty, if you can get up out of a chair with a lot less discomfort, and if the patient experiences significant relief with the diagnostic injection, then the next step uh, would be either a cortisone uh, sacroiliac injection, and depending on the effectiveness of the more the less invasive options, um, we would move on to the uh, minimally invasive sacroiliac fusion. Yep. Next question. Um, I can even I can answer this one. Who at OSC does this procedure? So that's uh, Dr. Sarage and Dr. McFarland are actually the only two physicians in the whole state of Virginia that uh, right now are offering this procedure and two very uh, skilled and, and, and proficient uh, physicians and, and surgeon and um, in their hands. Again, this is uh, it's probably a 15 minute minute procedure. So move on to the next one from there, unless you guys have anything to say to that. Um, let's see here, but both hips replaced by Dr. B. I'm still having back pain and neck pain. Would this help with what's going on now? I guess, again, Dr. Sarai just spoke to that, um, you know, kind of probably the, the, the best next step would be doing a consultation with, with one of the providers, um, and, and seeing, you know, in their expert opinion, if, if this is something that's going to benefit, benefit you. Um, uh, again, yep. Had hip replacement on the SI joint or on the side where they're having SI joint pain, would I still be a candidate for this? Again, I think Dr. McFarland and, and, and Sarage again have spoken to this. Um, we see a lot of patients who have had prior um, um, hip replacements who are, end up developing, um, you know, the SI joint pain as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, for could us we, really, could, it's, could, a, it's, about that, it's about that diagnostic injection. We're, we're gonna be seeing you, we're gonna be evaluating to see where your pain is coming from if you, if you everyone everyone can can think about if you, if you go to the dentist and the dentist has to numb a tooth they'll say you have a tooth that's sore the dentist numbs the tooth your pain goes away so the dentist can work on the tooth and that's basically what we're looking at we're we're thinking of the SI joint like a a bad tooth it's what's giving you pain and we're using that numbing medication to confirm that if we put that medication into that joint that for that period of time, you know, the numbing medicine is only going to last for a couple hours. 
during that period of time, is that pain gone? Is it significantly relieved? Is your back better? Is your is your buttock pain better? Is some of the pain that even travels down your leg better just by numbing that joint that's become unstable and giving you pain? And if we can confirm that, if we can confirm that, and you will know almost instantaneously yourself, I mean, it's something that you're going to feel and, and, and tell us about. It's going to be an objective measure for you to say, that was my pain. Now that I've had that, I can see that that was my pain all along. My pain's better. And then we could potentially perform this procedure to resolve that pain. Mm -hmm. so that, that's what we're looking for to find, find the patients that we can really help with, with this procedure that that diagnostic injection confirms that your pain is from the sacroiliac joint. Yeah, very well said. Um, again, if I get tightness in my lower back, can that indicate an SI problem? Um, again, I think, you know, it's been covered, uh, obviously the, the workup prior, uh, you know, the, the physicians aren't just going to put you down and put the implant in you. They're going to make sure there's a workup to, to, you know, make sure that you're a right candidate beforehand. And I think a lot of, a lot of these conditions and a lot of people are talking about the, the other dysfunction, you know, when you have a joint, if you have a bad hip or a bad SI joint mm -hmm. or degeneration of your spine, it's going to affect your posture. It's going to affect the way you stand. It's going to affect the way you walk. It's going to affect your balance. You're going to lean to one side or the other to take stress off the joints. That's going to make your back muscles tight. It's going to make your gluteal tendon sore. You're going to get tendonitis. You're going to get bursitis. You're going to get a lot of other surrounding conditions because the joint is bad. Mm -hmm. So once you take care of that primary issue, the other issues, your posture improves, the inflammation over the tendons and the bursa improves. A lot of these other things will go away because you've taken take, taken care of the primary problem. Right. Yeah. Again, very very well said. Uh, looks like we have a patient of Dr. Andrus. Um, it's been diagnosed with sacroiliitis. Again, asked if it was a new procedure. Um, yep. And then they said, yeah, Dr. Like again, Dr. McFarland and Dr. Strader both very both very uh, well qualified to, to perform this procedure. Um, let's see here. Da, 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 da. I'm current patient of Dr. Burrow. Not exactly sure that is, but I told him we would not have back surgery scheduled for hip replacement in June. Pain is in the groin and feels like the muscle down to the knee. Um, again, I, you know, I don't want to overstep Dr. Strager, Dr. McFarland, but I think this is, uh, you know, uh, just a matter of patients coming in and, and making sure that, you know, the, the, the pain generator is SI joint, but I can let you guys speak to that if you want to comment on it any further. That, Rod. Yeah, Andrew, if we could if we could go back to the, uh, the the slide with the picture of the pelvis, the sacrum, and the I iliac. Yeah, yep. Maddie, can uh, we I can back? hopefully hopefully help explain um, you know the difference between the hip joint and the sacroiliac joint, which I think even my patients that I've I've been doing sacroiliac joint injections on, they may still refer to that injection as a hip injection. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the, the, the area where the spine attaches to the sacrum, uh, if we could point the pointer to the top of the sacrum, that's, that's where your lumbar spine attaches. And so that, uh, the sacrum is considered the very lowest bone in the spine, but everything above that is the lumbar spine where you know, we see the discs and that's where we place a lot of the uh, epidural injections. The two long lines on either side of the sacrum where it attaches to the ilium is where the sacroiliac joint is. Now diagonal and down from the sacroiliac joint on the outside of the ilium. Go over a little bit, Matty. Uh, if we can. Um, go to the left, if you don't mind. You go to the left and down over more, a little bit more. Yep, so that's the area where the hip joint is. And so the, the two areas are completely separate, although uh, often referred to as hip pain when patients are referring to sacroiliac joint and so, oftentimes the symptoms do overlap. Now, that is why oftentimes a hip replacement or, or the, I guess the gait abnormality leading up to the hip replacement from wear and tear of the joint will lead to a, a sacroiliac joint problem that may not go away completely after the hip replacement. And so if you've had a hip replacement or if you've had a lumbar fusion, as Dr. McFarland said, other problems may still exist. You may still have a bad sacroiliac joint that needs to be addressed um, at a, at a separate, um, as a separate issue. Yeah, very well said there. Let's see here. Um, 
Oops, sorry, let me scroll back up to the questions here. Uh, let's see. Where did it go? Oh, is this material you place in the center of the implant similar to the bone in a bottle an oral surgeon would use? I'm not sure what bone in the bottle is, if you guys know, but. Yes, I mean, the bone in the bottle basically is demineralized bone matrix. A lot of times they'll place, let's say you have to have an implant placed into your jaw. You have to have a, 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 a new implant placed. They'll use a bone graft that they'll plant into the socket and let that generate new bone for a period of time. They may, they may put that in there for three to six months to let bone generate in the jaw that then they can go and place an implant into. This is basically the same material. It's a demineralized bone matrix. It's cadaveric bone, cortical bone, that's been acid washed to re reduce it, to get rid of all the cellularity, meaning there's no DNA, there's no real human structure. It's, it's, just a, it's just a network of bone that acts like a lattice for your body to grow new bone into, if that, if that makes sense to everybody. Um, but it is basically the same type of product that a dentist would use uh, when they're working on your jaw. Right. Um, next question for Dr. McFarland, patient of yours, looks like they were diagnosed with ankylosing spondyl, uh, spondylitis two weeks okay. ago. Um, am, I, am I a candidate for this procedure? They're asking. It, it depends. Ankylosing spondylitis is an inflammatory condition that can cause the joint to become very stiff and very inflamed and, and obviously causes a lot of sacroiliitis. Now, if we look on a CT scan and we see that your joint has already autofused, which is, it's a common problem that we see in ankylosing spondylitis is the joint will actually fuse itself together. If the joint is already fused by your condition, fusing it again with this procedure is not going to help. If we look on a CT scan or an MRI and we see that the, that the joint is becoming stiff, it's becoming degenerated, you're developing spurs around it, and it has not fused, and we confirm with one of these diagnostic injections that that injection significantly reduces your pain, yes, you're a great candidate. You're absolutely one of the, the, the best candidates for the procedure to stabilize that joint. But it would have to be, we would have to confirm with the test the diagnostic test as well as the CT to make sure your joint hasn't already fused. Do you see a lot of AS patients yourself, Raj? That you treat. So, if uh, if we just if we suspect an inflammatory arthritis, um, usually we'll refer to the rheumatologist. And in this patient's case, if blood work and and um, oftentimes DNA testing to look for certain blood markers confirms that they have ankylosing spondylitis. Oftentimes, especially two weeks into the diagnosis, oftentimes just simple medication changes should help with reduce the inflammation in the joint to a point where it's much more livable. Now, if after all the medication changes that the rheumatologist does for the patient, the patient is still suffering with chronic sacroiliac joint pain, then we would go to the point where we do the diagnostic injection to see if the patient will get significant pain relief um, and also review the imaging to make sure that it hasn't already fused. All right, next question. Um, not a question, it just says painful takes my breath away. So it looks like they're in a lot of pain. Um, can this help with spondylolisthesis? Spondylolisthesis is a separate condition of the, the lumbar spine where the spine has become degenerated and it's now unstable. And that obviously will create a lot of back pain. It'll compress the nerves and give you a lot of numbness or tingling or perceived weakness down the leg. It's a separate condition that we treat as well, but this, this procedure uh, would not help with the spondylolisthesis. But that's part of our evaluation. You know, a lot of patients may come in to see us hoping that this procedure is gonna help them and we may find that they have a spondylolisthesis or they have ankylosing spondylitis or they have other conditions that are very treatable. And it, it's really kind of confirming what is your true pain generator and working through that process to see what would help you. Um, next question says, how long do you usually have to wait between doing the procedure if you wanted it bilaterally? I, I, I can answer that. You, you really, I mean, it's, it's you know, at least I'll, I'll start uh, the, the procedures that I've seen done bilaterally. It's uh, 
it's really the physician physician preference. Um, you know, we have patients that'll do one side and then they feel up to it, you know, two weeks later, three weeks later, we'll come back and get the other side done. So again, it's really kind of um, up to the physician, but Dr. Sarajah, Dr. McFarland, if you want to speak to that, feel free. I typically even... For my patients, even if I do a carpal tunnel on a patient bilaterally, I'll typically separate them six weeks. So that's just, that's my traditional number. I like to really let you get through that initial two-week inflammatory phase of, of whatever the procedure is. A uh, couple weeks of doing some rehab, a couple weeks of feeling pretty good before we tackle the next side, you know, just <laughs> give it a little bit of time. So usually usually for me, I'm going to encourage my patients to to schedule them six weeks apart. Yeah, and, and you know, for the first several weeks, there may be some procedural discomfort and and problems with with uh, pain with walking, and if we create that same pain on both sides at the same time, the patient can't be as active as we'd like. So, I, I do think waiting several weeks between doing one side and then the next is is probably a, a very good idea. And, and six weeks actually sounds like a really good idea, so the patient has time to heal, get back somewhat of a normal gait before we go and address the other side. Great. All right. Next question. Is there a trial before a permanent procedure? The trial is the diagnostic injection. If, if uh, we've been doing sacroiliac joint injections already and you've been getting good relief and um, they becoming, they're becoming less effective over time or they're lasting for much less of a period of time, a diagnostic injection can still help confirm that that is where the pain is coming from, even if it only provides pain relief for several hours until the anesthetic wears off. But that essentially is the trial. We're not putting a, 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 a spacer in there temporarily and then taking it out and then deciding if the patient's a candidate. We're confirming that that is where the primary pain is coming from that they're experiencing, looking for pain relief and then performing the procedure. Yep. All right, um, next question. Is this procedure considered a permanent solution? Correct. It's a, it would be a permanent solution for that joint. Um, obviously, we, the, the goal is to obtain a fusion. Uh, this procedure will have about an 85 to 90 percent fusion rate. Uh, if it doesn't fuse, then we still have other options to try to force the joint to fuse, whether it's with a, a type of bone growth stimulator or if it's alternative procedures. But the, the goal is to get the fusion. If we've confirmed that this joint is the pain generator, there's a 90% that we're going to have a permanent solution by using this very minimally invasive almond size implant that can be placed in 15 minutes. So um, obviously as a surgeon, if I need to, I could come back and revise this with a, a more open procedures per se to stabilize the joint, which is what we're trying to avoid. All right. Um, got an avid, avid exerciser and golf participant. How long will I be down before I can return to these activities? So Mark, Mark you covered that. It's, I'm going to let you handle uh, that. <laughs> and, and so, you know, the, the most important thing with this procedure is allowing that, that bone to fuse, uh, both surfaces of the sacroiliac joint to fuse. And the less explosive movements you can do in the first 12 weeks, the better. I would say that after about 20 weeks of healing, uh, the, the bone is, is probably getting to the point where doing you know, some uh, weight lifting or bending or twisting is probably not going to affect that joint. Uh, but early on, probably the first 12 weeks, you don't wanna do any of that excessive twisting. And even though golf is on, on the slide listed as a um, more forceful uh, sport, like swimming and, and running and things like that, um, the main thing is not so much force as it is the twisting of the pelvis during the golf swing. And, and if that fusion hasn't fully taken hold, you don't want to disrupt that at all. So, but at, once the patient's feeling really good and it's been uh, three months or so, it's going to be patient to patient dependent. Um, obviously, as Dr. McFarland said, we're going to be getting x-rays at three months and probably six months, making sure everything is looking good and that the fusion is taking hold. And if there's really no uh, warning signs of the, the fusion not being fully uh, mature, then I, I probably will return you to most activities at that point. All right. Um, are there any risks involved when having this procedure? The main risk, you know, it, it's 
sort of have the procedure. Uh, you have a chance of infection. You know, when we look at sacroiliac joint procedures in general, the risk of infection can be up to 10%. With this procedure, it's going to be 1% or less of a risk, especially when we're giving you antibiotics both pre and post procedure. Uh, the, the main risk that I see is that the, the, the known 10% of patients that won't fuse. And then if we need to move forward with additional options, we'd have to perform a different type of procedure, um, a more open procedure to get the joint to fuse. Uh, there's no risk of anesthesia because there is no anesthesia. Basically, we're talking about lidocaine for the most part, the same procedure, the same medication you would have if you had a, a cut on your skin that you were having repaired or if you went to the dentist to have um, a procedure at the dental office. Um, so the numbing medication obviously is very different than going to the hospital and being put asleep with propofol or other general anesthetics that could have could have issues for you from a cognitive standpoint, but also have high stress on your heart and your lungs and other organ systems. You simply won't have that with this procedure since we're only using a local anesthetic. Yeah, all right. Um... Uh, this patient had a pacemaker installed on March 1st. Can they still do the procedure? So then the main question is, uh, as far as blood thinners go, generally, because this doesn't involve um, a significant incision and it's not a very deep procedure, I probably will not have patients discontinue blood thinners prior to, um, unless they're on high dose, uh, Coumadin or, or some medication like that, and every case every case will be um, a case by case basis, right? So uh, but there's nothing about the procedure itself that precludes us from doing the uh, the implant. So you know, if if you have to have an MRI, we can still do a CT scan instead. Um, but as long as you're you know healthy after your pacemaker from a cardiac standpoint, there's really no reason that we can't do it in the office. Mm -hmm. Um, this one might be one from Dr. McFarland, but um, I could answer it too. But procedure is, is this procedure limited to SI joint, or is it also used to address cervical joint issues? Strictly for the sacroiliac joint, there are other procedures that are similar in their approach for joints in the cervical spine or the lumbar spine, where we can percutaneously treat the joints, the facet joints, and fuse those joints. So. I mean, the exciting part of this, a lot of the things that we do nowadays are becoming less and less and less invasive for you, you know, as a patient. Um, it requires smaller incisions and can be done uh, in outpatient or surgical center settings or even in the office, like we're talking about with this procedure. But this procedure is strictly for lower back pain that's consistent and confirmed to be related to the sacroiliac joints. All right. Uh, next question, is obesity a contributing factor? Yes. I, yeah, I, so I, any, I, anything that, oh. yeah, anything that changes the, the rotation of the pelvis and puts more stress on the sacroiliac joint, um, it can be obesity, it can be a beer belly where your, your belly juts out more so your lower back curves more and then your pelvis has to adjust for that uh, excess uh, lower back curvature by shifting forward more. Anything that's changing the mechanical forces of how your weight is being transferred through, the, through that joint, especially uh, being overweight, can lead to sacroiliac joint dysfunction. And uh, our patients are encouraged to try to work as hard as they can to lose that weight because naturally the less uh, stress you have um, passing through the joint and lower spine is going to lead to improvement in that pain. Okay, next question. Well, it says, how soon can I call for a consultation? So there's actually instructions on the screen. I know Dr. Surajan and Dr. McFarland and I were chatting beforehand. Um, the office is, is uh, geared up, ready for patients who would like a consultation for this procedure. I don't know if Dr. Surajan or Dr. McFarland, if you want to speak to that, but um, you could probably call tomorrow if, if they're able to. Absolutely. You can call in most patients in our office we're typically going to get you in to see us within a week if you want to be seen with either myself or Dr. Serasia to evaluate this, uh, see if you're, uh, uh, and we're real, 
we're thinking about this procedure, obviously, but when you come in to see us for a possible pain tech procedure or a sacroiliac joint issue, we're, we're still looking at you as a patient to, to figure out what your primary problem is, what your primary pain generator is. So just because you see me doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to be the procedure for you. Hopefully it is, since it's very minimally invasive and the results are great, but we're really looking to say, okay, what's your problem? What, what, what options do you have from a, a very minimally invasive approach to, to take care of it? And, and then we kind of set you off on that diagnostic, you know, protocol to say, can we prove what your pain generator is so that we can help you? Yeah. And, and, Dr. McFarlane and I both have patients that we already see for chronic sacroiliac joint pain that obviously, based on what we talked about tonight, would be a, a good candidate for this. And I know he probably feels the same way I do, but it's been very frustrating as a, as a provider to run out of options. And we, we did have that, that problem before this procedure came out where after a while, the only option we had for our patients was sending them for a, a major open SI joint fusion, which it was never an option that either one of us preferred to use, um, except in you know very extreme cases. So having this option for folks that are having chronic SI joint pain is is a game changer, I think. Yeah. Okay, next one um, doesn't necessarily look like a question, but just they have uh, stenosis at four or five. Uh, feels like the joint. Feel uh, feels like the joint you picture. It has spinal injections. PT no longer helps. So again you know, kind of identifying some of the um, workup that, that you know, Dr. Sarajan, Dr. McFarland would perform on you um, for a consultation. Uh, next question here, I guess we've answered this one already as well. Is this a permanent fix? Uh, yes, this is meant to be a permanent fix. Um, like Dr. McFarland said in the event that, you know, it, it's not, there are other uh, procedures that, that can be performed. Um, Let's see, would we be able to make an appointment with one of the doctors since they're patient at OSC? So, uh, yes, this is, yeah. yep, go ahead if you want to speak to that, Dr. McFarland. No, absolutely. Be okay. glad to glad to see anyone that wants us to, to take a look and see if we can help them. Um, next question here. So this patient didn't have any relief from injections. Does that mean they're not a candidate? Um, not sure if they meant no long-term relief or... You know, we see some patients even might get a couple hours of relief, but if it's not substantial, it's it's seen as no relief at all. And, you know, a lot of these injections, I see patients all the time that said they've had injections, they were never beneficial. There are so many different types of injections that we do, whether it's a simple cortisone injection into the tissues, whether it's a spinal epidural, whether it's an injection in the facets or an injection in the SI joints or injections in the hips. So a lot of times... Patients don't really understand exactly what the doctor was doing or what they were injecting the medicine into to confirm what the problem was. So with these procedures, it's not necessarily that we're injecting a steroid to try to get long-term relief. We're injecting the lidocaine to try to numb that specific joint to confirm the problem. You know, So this is different. We're not trying to give you an injection to resolve your problem for a long period of time. We're trying to use this numbing medicine to confirm your problem, to assure that that is the pain generator so that we can fix it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very different than the typical injections. Here's another here's a pretty good, it's a good question. They've all been good questions, but this is, uh, does this end the flexibility of the joint? Well, as we discussed before, oftentimes the pain of, of sacroiliitis or sacroiliac joint dysfunction is coming from excessive movement within the joint. And those joints that are excessively tight is usually because of arthritis that's developed in the joint. So you have a problem of too tight or you have a problem of too loose and you are looking to stabilize it. Now, in, in cases of arthritis, when you put that implant in, you're actually distracting or pushing apart that joint a little bit. So those surfaces that have been rubbing for all that time are no longer rubbing. And those joints that have been unstable for all that time are no longer unstable once that bone matrix grows and the two surfaces of the bone fuse together. So you're addressing both issues, which, um, and I guess the answer to the question is you don't lose any flexibility. In fact, once your pain improves and you stop you know, movements that cause pain or what we call guarding, 
then hopefully with physical therapy and over time, you're able to regain a more natural range of motion, not only throughout the spine, but in the hips and, and lower extremities as well. Completely agree. Yep. 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 Yeah, very well said. Uh, this next question kind of could parlay it into that a little bit, but after the surgery is completely healed, are there any physical limitations as a result of the uh, fusion? No. No, there wouldn't be any long-term limitations or activity restrictions once it has fused. And usually that's, you know, as long as you're, the healing process occurs um, within 20 weeks, you know, with, and most spinal fusions or SI joint fusions or other fusions in the body are mature four to six months after the procedure. And I will add uh, the thing that we're doing here and a little bit different than some of the other companies is we're trying to restore the normal anatomy of the joint. Um, you know, your SI joint has, has some motion in it. And we want to, we want that to, to, you know, turn back the hands of time on that joint. Um, would this procedure be a possibility to treat other joint pain, such as neck issues in the future? I need to be seen for something else there. Oh, not, not this particular procedure, but procedures like this, when mm -hmm. we're able to see that we can do things very minimally invasively to stabilize this joint. Of course, those ideas and those technologies are then taken to other parts of the body. And we find that we can do a similar things with the cervical spine or with the lumbar spine. So we are going to see that in the next 10 years, 15 years, that these procedures are taken to other parts of the body and will work well. I can think of multiple joints that where we could do this kind of procedure very minimally invasively. It's just the product's not out there. The company's not out there that that does that procedure. Pain tech may be the one to do that. We'll see. We'll see yeah. over time. Or, the, or that patient, maybe uh, maybe we'll all be working for that patient here at some, at some point. <laughs> maybe so. <laughs> Great. All right. Now it looks like last question right now. It says uh, this patient has a fractured pelvis. Hopefully it is it is all healed. Uh, they've had relief from injections. Can they be considered for for pain tech procedure, the SI SI stability procedure? You think they're talking about a sacroplasty, like a sacral fracture? or somewhere else in the pelvis, it's hard to say. If it's a, a fracture in the sacrum and the fracture is not healing, then that can be repaired with a little bit of bone cement placed through the fracture line. If it's a fracture elsewhere in the pelvis that can't be treated surgically, usually that's allowed some time to heal. Now, once everything heals and, and they're left with just simple sacroiliac joint pain and we're not dealing with fracture pain, then yes, this would be an option. And sacroiliitis is a common sequela of pelvic fractures. When you have enough stress that goes through the pelvis to break the bone, you obviously can cause shear forces that can lead to some instability and inflammation around the sacroiliac joint. So uh, that's a common problem that we see even after the bone has healed around the, around the pelvis that patients have sacroiliitis that would, needs to be treated. Very well said. Well, that was, uh, that was the last question we had. Uh, actually, whoops, look, looks like one more just popped up here. Let's see what we have. Uh, had many injections, last approximately two to three weeks. Just had MRI of my hips and lumbar area as well as my pelvis. All comes back to SI joint. Blood work had moderate mark, markers of inflammation. It's supposed to be referred to rheumatologist. Haven't heard, haven't heard anything yet. Should I see you first? They're asking if they should come see you first before seeing a rheumatologist. It, like I mentioned before, if there is an actual autoimmune inflammatory issue going on, that should be addressed first. Oftentimes, that's enough to address a lot of that inflammatory pain. Um, if that has been addressed and they're being treated for something like rheumatoid arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis, and they feel like they've maximized their treatment from that stand from the rheumatology standpoint, then obviously that this would be something that we can address. Um, I, I would. Uh, use this the same way as, uh, or met, uh, preface this the same way as the patient who has just been diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis two weeks ago in that um, you really want to address the inflammatory component of the pain before you start uh, looking at injection options and, and other more invasive options than just simple medication uh, changes. Okay. Well, it looks like unless another question pops up here, that's all the questions we had. Um, 
I want to thank everybody for jumping on here. Um, again, the, the next steps are, are on the screen here, but you know, we can, we can, uh, or you're able to schedule a consult with Dr. Srager, Dr. McFarland. They'll do a, uh, they'll do a complete workup um, and see if that this, uh, see if this is something that would ultimately be beneficial for you. Um, again, this, this uh, webinar is recorded, so we're going to send out a recording. Um, and then again, my, my contact is on the screen here. That's my email and cell phone number. Um, so if you do have any other questions, uh, feel free to call or, or text me. Um, again, appreciate Dr. McFarland and Dr. Sarada for jumping on. And if either of you have anything to, to say, um, you're more than welcome to. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, I know Dr. McFarland agrees. Um, we are very excited about this uh, new option we have for our patients. Absolutely. Hope to see uh, anyone that needs us to take a look at him over the next few weeks and uh, see if we can be of help. Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks again. I appreciate you guys um, to Dr. McFarland, Dr. Srage, and then for everybody jumping on tonight. Yep. We'll see everyone. Okay. Have a good Thank night. Thank you.